today. I hope that this will be interesting and useful to you as you go back to your own organizations. Um, and I'm going through a lot of information pretty quickly, so please feel free to write down any questions that you have, and I'm also available to talk with you after this or even in the coming weeks if you miss something or want to talk about something a little more thoroughly. So um, I'm going to be talking about um, what I call data-driven marketing strategies. So it's looking at really what's going on in your shelter and making marketing decisions based on that information. Um, so uh, if you'll indulge me a little bit about me, is really just an excuse to put my cats on <laughs> a slide. Um, but I've been the communications and development manager at the Cat Adoption team for about two, two and a half years now. And I've been with Cat for about four years. I worked um, initially there as a shelter associate, so I did actual animal caregiving and adoption counseling. So I've been on the floor there as well as sort of behind the scenes doing communications and, and fundraising. Um, my experience prior to that was actually uh, much more in the communications world. I, I wrote uh, janitorial supply copy. So if you're reading about a urinal cake, uh, that might be me that wrote that uh, in your Staples catalog. Uh, and then I did that for about uh, five years. And then I worked at DePaul University in Chicago uh, as a communicator there. And I worked with their alumni relations and fundraising department. And then I decided that all of that was really boring and I loved animals and always had wanted to work with them. And I went and got a master's degree in anthrozoology, um, which is what I was doing while I worked as a shelter associate. So that gave me a whole new way of looking at the relationship between people and other animals. And I really focused my study there on uh, sort of the interactions between people and animals in a shelter environment. And one of the studies that I did as sort of my capstone thesis project was about black dog syndrome, which I don't know if people are familiar with that concept. Um, and I actually found out some really interesting statistics for here in the Portland area. And that's what kind of drove me to this idea of really using data-driven, fact-driven marketing to help your animals. If anyone's curious about the program at Canisius, I'd be happy to talk about that as well. It's awesome. And I love it. Uh, so kind of what we're going to be talking about today is what am I talking about when I say data? What data am I telling you to get? and why would that inform my marketing decision? Um, why the data-driven marketing sort of idea is better than just doing guesswork marketing, throwing stuff at the wall, seeing what sticks. And then finally looking at how we started implementing this idea at CAT and sort of what the results of that have been. I don't know, it left? Oh, it likes that, okay. Uh, so a couple of things that I kind of want to put out there right up front uh, is that I'm going to talk about a couple of things that make people a little bit uncomfortable. And one of those things is that I'm talking about animals in sort of a retail sense, which can kind of get people to put their hackles up because they're like, hey, these aren't boxes of cereal. And I totally agree with you. I love animals. I think that they're individuals and that they all need special care and concern. But the fact of the matter is when adopters walk into your shelter or walk into your foster home, they're thinking with a retail shopper's mentality. So you have to think of some of those things as they can relate to animals. Obviously, you're not going to have a back stock of black and white dogs that you can bring out if the black and white dog gets adopted. But there are some retail-based uh, things you can do that are going to help with your adoptions. Uh, the second thing I'm going to ask is that when you're looking at data, you really have to put your assumptions aside and take the things that you just know in your heart to be true and be willing to let go of them when the data doesn't match what you're thinking. Um, and that's really hard to do, especially if you're like, but last week I just had this experience that tells me this is true. But if your data over the last year tells you it's not, it probably isn't. And those are both sort of difficult things that I struggle with and that you may struggle with as you um, look at, start looking at your data or thinking about that. Um, so when I'm talking about this data, uh, this all-encompassing term, I think there are sort of three, four-ish pieces uh, of adoption information that you can use that's going to help you to make good marketing decisions. And one of those things is how many animals should you have available for adoption at any given time. And this might vary a little bit for sort of foster-based organizations, but for a shelter-based organization, you can actually use some simple math to figure out what that number is. And the reason that that's important is that it helps you 
to not have too much or too little choice. When your adopters walk into an organization and they're looking for a cat or a dog or a hamster, if they're overwhelmed by 300 very wonderful adoptable animals, they might often leave without getting to know any of them because it's just too overwhelming. Or if they come in and there's only two kittens available, there's this sense of like, oh, these are the last two. It's like the last two tops on the rack. No one wanted them. They're on, you know, it's that kind of idea. So thinking about how many animals is the ideal number for you to have available for adoption. A uh, second piece of information that you're going to want to find out is which of your animals are getting adopted fastest or slowest. And why this is important is because it can help you figure out who you really should be helping with additional marketing. Obviously, you're always going to be wanting, wanting to do some sort of general um, get to know me, know about my organization, and bring people in. But when you're thinking about doing marketing promotions or events for a specific type of animal, you want to be helping the animals that need your help the most. If uh, calico kittens are flying off the shelves, you don't need to do a calico kitten event. Uh, that's not going to be useful. And it's also going to help you with this next piece, which is where are your best adoption locations? And this is, again, sort of a product placement uh, mentality. But it's are there places in your shelter or are there homes within your foster system where animals tend to move through really, really quickly or the opposite very, very slowly? And I'll talk a little bit about how um, Kat found that information at, at our organization. But really, you're just going to be looking at your own shelters or organizations information to figure that out. And that's going to help you decide where to put different animals. Um, you don't always have the luxury of getting the exact number of available animals on site, or you might not have the best adoption location when you get in the right animal. So you have to be a little bit flexible. But if you can kind of use these ideas as you're thinking about the types of animals you have available and what types of different things you're doing for them, it's going to be really helpful. Um, so how many animals should you have available? Um, UC Davis Shelter Medicine Program came up with sort of a formula, and they did a lot of research, and this is something that's been going on in the shelter industry uh, quite a bit just over the last few years, and it's this idea of adoption-driven capacity. And uh, as you can see, that's basically the perfect number of animals that you should have available for adoption at one time. And again, that's too few adopters or too few animals. You're not going to get a lot of adoptions too many animals. You're not going to get a lot of adoptions. And there's a second piece, of course, which is how many animals your organization can appropriately care for. Uh, so it helps with figuring that out, too. But I'm going to focus a little bit more on the marketing side of that. So uh, the basic idea is that if you, you know, have 10 animals awaiting adoption, one person walks in, each of those animals has a 1 in 10 chance of getting adopted. So if you have 500 animals and you get three adopters a week, the odds of those animals getting adopted are really low. And maybe by decreasing your adoption capacity, you'll actually increase the number of adoptions you're doing, helping those animals get out of the shelter faster and saving them from things like illness or behavioral issues that can crop up when they're staying uh, for a longer time. And so this is a, ca a calculation, very straightforward, that you can do at your organization uh, that helps you figure out what that magical number is. And what you want to do is you want to look at your annual number of adoptions and or your goal number of adoptions. And you're going to divide that by 365. So in our example, we want to have 12,000 adoptions a year divided by 365 suggests that we want to do about three adoptions a day on average. We also want to think about our length of stay. So this is the number of days that an animal remains in your care. And there's two ways of looking at this number. The most helpful one is going to be looking at the number of days an animal was actually available for adoption. Because if they're spending 10 days in the hospital where they're not being viewed by the public, you're not getting good information about how long they were actually seen by the public before they went home. But that number can sometimes be trickier to find depending on what your records and database system is like. Typically, you're going to strive for 7 to 10 days. Obviously, even fewer is, is better as long as it's still good matches. Um, so that's the length of stay, 7 to 10 days, or the length of availability for adoption that you're going to be wanting to work toward. And so in our, again, in our example, we chose 7 days. 
And that tells us that 23 animals is the largest amount of animals we should have available at any one time in order to make our goal of 12,000 adoptions. 1,200 adoptions, thank you. 12,000 adoptions, <laughs> also you. an amazing uh, opportunity, but you might need more than 23 available at a time. Um, and uh, the, I think the scary thing about this math, and I know it was uh, I know it was scary for Kat when we started looking at it, is you're telling me to take in fewer animals. How am I helping all of these animals that are out there and that need help? And the trick is that these animals are coming in and going out at a rate at which you can actually take in and care for and get adopted out more animals. So it, it, it seems unintuitive, but it actually truly works. And I'll show you. Ah how it's made a difference to cat here in a minute. Uh, the other thing you want to know is who's getting adopted and how fast. So uh, obviously, if your experience is anything like mine, you're seeing puppies and kittens and younger animals tend to go home more quickly, um, unless, of course, you're a senior-based organization and you don't have kittens and puppies. Um, and your older animals, animals with a behavior issue, animals who have a medical issue, even if it was something that's been treated, that's still gonna impact how long they're staying in your shelter. Uh, and that's gonna give you some important information because if Siamese mixed kittens at your shelter get adopted in a day, almost every time they're on the floor, having a special promotion that's geared to get adopters in to adopt Siamese kittens is a waste of your time and money. If you have a bunch of senior cats who, with medical issues, who are sitting in your shelter for months on end, they're the ones that your marketing should be focused on uh, because they're not adopting out themselves, as it were. And then in terms of determining who are those slow animals or who are those fast animals, it's really important to look at your own data because what's happening at my shelter might be completely different from what's happening at your shelter, even if we're in the same geographic location. Um, and one, the three sort of main um, indicators that you can use that show length of stay are coat color, age, and breed. And if you're a breed specific or an age specific rescue, you can still use the other two to help you kind of figure some of this out. And in my experience, if you think about coat color versus length of stay, that's gonna inform your adoption events and promotions or your breeds or your ages. So maybe you need to be spending more time promoting your senior animals and less time with those one to five year olds. Or maybe uh, all your pit bull type dogs are sitting in the shelter, maybe, uh, for longer than your teacup poodles. Um, is that a thing, a teacup poodle? Did I just make that up? That's a thing? <laughs> I don't know about dogs, guys. Uh, so, but if you had an, a new, brand new dog, it probably would get adopted quickly, unless it was huge. Um, size isn't on there, but that is another great indicator, um, particularly for dogs. For cats, it tends to be age and coat color a little stronger. For dogs, it tends to be uh, breed and coat color a little bit stronger. And then location, and that's what we were talking about uh, with are there homes or are there places, certain kennels where animals seem to move through quickly. And that's gonna inform which type of animals you're placing where in your shelter. And it might seem, again, like, oh, I have this kennel where animals get adopted from it really, really quickly. So I'm gonna put an animal that I know isn't gonna get adopted very quickly into that kennel. It actually doesn't work. You actually still need to put the types of animals that get adopted quickly into that kennel for it to keep up that momentum. Because that means that more animals are coming in and going through that kennel faster and faster. And maybe you have a kennel that's a little bit off to the side or it's down this weird hallway or whatever it might be that's causing that to get less adoptions. You're still gonna wanna put your sort of medium uh, adoptable animals in that space. Otherwise, you're eating up your really good quick space by placing those animals in that. Does that make sense? Um, it, it seems like it wouldn't, but I, it, we're doing it, it's working. I believe in it. <laughs> um, and then this is um, from the study I did about uh, black dog syndrome. So this is kind of showing you how you can look at um, certain things 
compared to your length of, of stay or length of availability. So uh, I actually looked at about 20,000 uh, dog records over a two-year adoption period from a couple of animal shelters within the uh, Portland metro area and found that at both shelters, black coat, black dogs, um, regardless of age, et cetera, et cetera, get adopted as quickly or more quickly than almost all other dogs in the shelter. Um, interestingly, also looked at breed group and probably not surprising to many of you, uh, the bully breeds <coughs> stayed almost three times as long as some of the other dogs did. So again, if you're in this toy group with your not imaginary teacup poodle, you can see they're flying out the door in five to 10 days and those bully breeds are staying around 25, 30 days on average. Uh, excuse me, I'm eating my hair. Uh, so this is really informative if you're trying to think about the types of animals in your care that maybe needed a little bit extra marketing or extra promotion. Um, and then that, that third piece, location, location, location. So whether you are in your own shelter environment, whether you have various foster homes, whether you are foster based but you go out to uh, different pet supply stores to show your animals in the community. It's really interesting and really informative if you look and see when we take 10 dogs to the pet supply specialty store, they all get adopted on Saturdays but when we go on Tuesdays, no one does. So, you know, that's that's still, that's time, but that's also location. Or maybe you find out, you know, we have this one foster home and that foster parent is just amazing at self-marketing and self-promoting the animal that they have in their home. And maybe it makes sense to figure out what they're doing, talk to them about it, and see if it's some things that we can implement in, a, in some of our other homes and encourage our other fosters to do as well and to bring their numbers up. Uh, and then literally within your shelter, there can be spaces. Um, at CAT, we looked at sort of, uh, we have a square-shaped um, adoption facility for our adult cats, and we looked at, you know, do more cats get adopted from the front, the side, the back? Um, we have free-roaming cat rooms, so there's rooms you can go through down the side, our cats, and they're longer or shorter. And we actually used some of that information to determine where we're going to place new cats coming through based on what we determine to be faster or slower moving animals. Uh, so why do these stats matter? They matter because when you're using data driven marketing, you're gonna increase your total adoptions and you're gonna help those animals that are harder to place, your sort of targeted market groups. So uh, I can tell you at, at Cat Adoption Team when I do a marketing program, or I, when we do a, a um, marketing promotion for black cats, because we have found, ignore my black dog syndrome, we have found in our data that our black cats tend to stay around a little bit longer. And there's also times of year when our shelter gets especially full of more animals that are black coated, both adults and kittens. When we target and promote those animals through an adoption special, um, typically with reduced adoption fees, two-thirds of those animals that go home during that time will be the targeted group animal, whereas on an average week, it's closer to a third. So it really does make a difference in who's coming in and who's going home during those adoption specials. Um, and as I was saying, it's really important that you get your own information. Um, you, you, you can't rely on what feels right. You can't rely on what seems like it's happening. Oh, we always have black dogs that are always here staying forever. The data doesn't show that. Um, and that data doesn't necessarily apply at a shelter in central Oregon. Um, uh, just a good example of that is that uh, at CAT, and I think in the Portland metro area, Siamese mixed cats tend to get adopted very, very quickly. They're very desirable. In uh, Fresno, where we do some um, transport, Tuxedo cats are what flies there. And they're like, hey, let us send you our Siamese mixes who are sitting here not getting adopted. And, and we're like, yeah, we can get them into homes and get them out of the shelter environment really quickly. So um, using that information to help you decide which animals to move where, which animals um, are moving at your specific organization, that's really important because you, 
if you're relying on the wrong information, you're just wasting your time and your money, which is exactly what this slide says. <laughs> you have to use that information to drive your marketing. If you're just throwing stuff at the wall, you're, you're just eating your money. Um, and you're eating your time. And you're not helping as many animals get home. Um, and also, I just thought that was kind of cute. Although I'm not really a huge fan of the animal shaming in general. Uh, I thought that was cute, nonetheless. So, um, so I can talk until I'm blue in the face about how important it is and how it works, and it's so great, and everyone should do it. Um, but here's some like actual proof of things that are working. So over the past couple of years, particularly particularly in 2013, 2014, um, cats made some very uh, specific and and thoughtful changes to our adoption programs. Um, based on both this adoption-driven capacity idea and this data-driven marketing idea. And what we've seen are a lot more uh, great matches and adoptions. Uh, one of the things that we did was we actually lowered our capacity. And as I was saying earlier, that was very stressful for, for the staff, for the volunteers, for people in the community who might have heard about it. Like, you, you're supposed to take in hundreds and hundreds of animals. That's what you do. You have space. You take in cats. You put them wherever you can put them, and that's how you save the most cats. And it's turned out to be that we did a lot more adoptions when we decreased our capacity. And we're also providing a lot better experience for those animals while they're with us because we're taking in a correct number of animals that we can actually carefully, thoughtfully, and individually care for. So we've been able to do things like increase our enrichment activities, uh, individualize care and plans for different cats. Um, by decreasing our capacity, we increased space for each animal that's there. So they're staying healthier, they're staying happier, they're being adopted more quickly. Um, and then again, that sort of product placement idea where we do, we actually did a numbering system um, as cats come in, we sort of track them based on things that we know can cause a cat to stay longer or get home more quickly. And we do score the animals as they come in, and they get a different number based on, I have this coat color, I have this temperament, um, this type of breed mix, I'm this age, etc. Add up all of those numbers, and it gives them sort of a score. So they're either going to be moving through the shelter, we think, probably pretty quickly, sort of average, or kind of slowly. And we use that to help determine where we're going to place them in the shelter right from the start. So if you're an animal who we expect is going to be with us for more than 30 days, why don't we just put you in that bigger kennel to start with rather than trying to move you in that kennel two weeks from now when we realize, oh, you're not getting adopted very quickly and just add to your stress. And then this data-driven marketing. So again, having marketing specials, promotions, discounts that bring more people into the shelter and get those targeted animals adopted out at a higher rate than we would normally. Um, I know one thing also that can make people uncomfortable is probably right here, which is reduced adoption rates. There's a sense that you know, you're not going to get the right adopters in the door. They're not going to be as serious. They're not going to take their animal as serious. They're not going to value it as highly. And that's just not what data and research has shown us. I didn't um, pull a bunch of stats about that, but I'd be happy to point you towards some articles and things where that's found if that's something that you want to talk about with your board or with your staff um, and get them comfortable, more comfortable with. Um, there's a lot of data that shows that the bond between those, those new adopters and their animal is just as strong. Um, but what it does do is like any sale, it brings more people in to see your animals and they're getting adopted. And if they're not adopting one of your targeted animals, they still came through your doors. They still know you exist. And they might have adopted another animal at full price. So um, they really can help. Um, this one we did uh, also was a reduced adoption. But what the real focus of that is, what one was, uh, was for a group of about 12 cats who had been in our shelter for much longer than average. And we were having trouble just finding them homes, several on that list didn't have any real obvious behavioral or medical issues. But you, as you probably know, 
you get to a sort of a, a certain point and people are like, that cat's been here so long, there must be a reason I'm not going to adopt it either. Um, and what this did was really pulled uh, all the staff and volunteers and rallied around these specific cats, reminded people, hey, show these cats. We got people on our social media and within our shelter excited about when those cats were going home and it made a big difference. And of course, we were focused on the cats we selected for that. It wasn't just 12 random cats. Uh, and then I think the results really, really speak for themselves. I'm, I'm really excited to be at CAT during all of this transition. I think it's really exciting. Um, and last year in 2014, compared to 2013, our adult CAT adoptions, and I'm focused on adults because again, for us, the kittens are, they go about the same every year for getting adopted. Our adult cat adoptions are up 31%, and that's with reducing our capacity of animals in the shelter at one time. So we helped more animals get into homes by having fewer animals in our shelter. Uh, our adult length of stay went down by 40%. Animals were getting adopted into homes 40% more quickly, uh, which is great for them. I actually would, pref would prefer to never see a cat in a shelter. Our long-termers, so. Uh, at the cat adoption team, we consider that cats that have been with us 90 or more days. This is incredible. It went down 77%. And we did not make changes to the types of animals that we are bringing into the shelter. Um, we are a, a, a limited admission shelter, so we do have some say in the types of animals we bring in, which I fully uh, am aware that that's different from organizations who are open admission uh, or county shelters who maybe don't have that luxury, as it were. Uh, but we actually didn't make any changes compared to our previous years of the types of animals that we were bringing through our system. The same number of senior animals, the same number of FIV positive animals, et cetera, and still had those results. And that's sort of that. Um, I think uh, that by making decisions that are really based in reality uh, of your organization and promoting those animals, placing them in the right places in your shelter, you can have a huge impact on the number of lives that you're saving and how well you're serving those animals. And again, um, a couple of uh, great resources if you're looking at adoption-driven capacity or you're looking at um, adoption discounts. Uh, UC Davis, um, sheltermedicine.com is actually where adoption-driven capacity, that's where that was uh, sort of created and studied and that's where that came out of. And then ASPCA Pro, has a ton of great resources and does a lot of research about adoption discounts, um, a little bit about animal placement in the shelter, and they're starting to talk a little bit more about this adoption-driven capacity idea as well. So um, see what you can do. Try it out. Thanks.